James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. When you get there, please stand as we'll honor the reading of God's Word. And uh, we're going, when you go through these verses that have lists like this, and we're looking at the different attributes of wisdom, uh, we spend a lot of time in these to to mine the depths of Scripture here, but uh, I do believe there's some benefit to that. And so today, uh, we're talking about how uh, the wisdom that is from above is gentle. And so James chapter 3, verses 13 and through 18, let's honor the reading of God's Word. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you so much for this blessed day, Lord, the honor that we have to gather here together. And Lord, we just pray that your hand and, and your blessing would be upon the preaching of your word this morning. And Lord, I pray that that's what gets taught, that's what gets preached, that's what gets said, and that's what gets heard. Lord, that it's your word. And Lord, not my opinion, but Lord, just strictly something that, that originates from you. And Lord, we just want to thank you again for your son Jesus Christ. Lord, he died for our sins and help us, help us to see him in ourselves and in each other. And Lord, help us to live the life that you've called us to live. Lord, it's in your son's most precious and holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen. <coughs> All right, so we're talking about heavenly wisdom, that wisdom that is from God and the identifying characteristics of that wisdom. And those traits and characteristics, they come from God and they manifest themselves in the lives of the born-again believers. Okay, so as James is talking here, he's saying this wisdom comes from God and that it will originate or it will manifest in you. Okay, people will see that. And the focus of these sermons is these characteristics and how our lives should bear these marks. But I think something that may help us, and I haven't really touched on it so much as maybe I should in the past few weeks, is because I focused on how we should show these characteristics. Okay, we have, I first showed that we were f supposed to be pure, and then that wisdom from above that we are supposed to be peaceable. But I think one thing that may help us is to realize how people that have those marks on their life, how they affect us. Okay, when we have those people in our lives, those, in that Christian fellowship, that they demonstrate that wisdom from above that is first pure. They do not drag us into their sin. That, you know, whether it be by peer pressure or what. And we typically th tend to think of teenagers, you know, being uh, enticed to sin by other people. But it happens with adults as well. Don't, you never grow out of that temptation. You never grow out of that situation. And so I pray that we have those people in our lives that show us the morally right way to live. And then the peaceable aspect of it. I, I pray that we all have those people that bring that peace into our lives. And when I talked about wisdom that is peaceable, we are called to be peacemakers. But there's going to be a little bit of conflict. We're going to have conflict in our lives, and we have to have conflict for peace to originate from that. And I pray that we have those people in our lives that bring that peace in there as well. But then there, it is gentle. And that's what we'll talk about today. And the gentle aspects of wisdom go hand in hand to what's next, and that's easy to be entreated. And that's what we'll talk about next week for the purposes of time and the depth and clarity. I have to kind of split them up. I wanted to do them together, but I'm not going to be able to this morning. But as a preview and somewhat to link them together, you can look at relationships, especially where there's someone in authority and someone in submission. You can look at the person in authority that it's good for them to be gentle, and the person in submission is easy to be entreated. It means they're, they're willing to obey those rules. Uh, some translations actually put easy to be entreated as submissive. But... That is next week. But I think we benefit from seeing both sides of that relationship 
uh, and how the wisdom that is from above demonstrates the authoritative side and the submissive side. But gentleness, or being gentle, gentleness is listed as a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And it's translated as gentleness in the King James, but most times it's translated as kindness. But it's a different word from what we're talking about here. So we really can't use the same uh, points, the same analogies. Uh, but the definition of the word here in James 3.17, and the Greek word is apiakis, the Strong's Concordance says this, it's, it means gentle, considerate, with an implication of tolerance and graciousness. And I think the key words here are considerate and graciousness. Okay, for someone to be gentle, as James is talking about gentle here, we have to be considerate and we have to be gracious. And so I mentioned that it could typically be used in, as for someone in a position of authority. And so when I look at it, it's a boss that maybe needs to be gentle to the people that work for him. It needs to be considerate and gracious to those people. You know, I think of issues... Uh, some bosses may not like it when somebody has to call in for sickness. And they may get mad. I, I know of people that's been written up and yelled at for it. But then you may have a good boss and say, I understand. I've been there. I've been sick too. We know. And, and so we see that that's that boss being considered and gracious and knowing, hey, that these things affect people. Or it's a parent that may need to understand that they need to raise their child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Paul writes that we should not provoke our children to wrath. You know, now, being gentle doesn't mean you can't be stern. Doesn't mean you can't be forceful. But there's a way to do things. And showing our children that we can be gentle even in a disciplined role. I think back to uh, one of my daughter's favorite songs is Daddy's Hands by Holly Dunn. And, you know, he's talking about daddy's hands, soft and kind when I was crying, hard as steel when I'd done wrong. You can be gentle and hard at the same time. And we also can look at it as needing to be used by somebody who may be in a debate or an argument or whatever you want to look at. And you may know you're right, but being gentle enough to where the people get the point. And... What I mean by that is we don't need to be a stumbling block by the way we convince people we're right in these debates and such. Now, a lot of your debates and arguments may center around a religious nature. And we've got to remember, speak the truth in love. You know, and, and sometimes that can be a blessing to have conversations with people that may believe a little bit different about some things than you do. And you can still have fellowship, but too many times I've seen people disagree about things of a religious nature, and they both can be born-again believers. You know, one may be a Methodist, one may be a Baptist, one may be Cumberland Presbyterian. There's different beliefs there. But we need to be able to talk and debate without our fellowship suffering. I have a former acquaintance who accused me of doing the work of Satan simply because I believed in the rapture. And he has completely, you know, blocked me on social media, will not talk to me. And so that's not being gentle. And I've also seen when you see Christians and non Christians debate that maybe the non Christian may leave hating God more than they did in the beginning. Not because the Christian was wrong, but maybe in the way they did it. If you ever look at maybe videos on YouTube or wherever, I think one of the guys that we can take lessons from when we're trying to witness to unbelievers is Ray Comfort. He, he definitely is, he shows them love, he shows them grace, and he's gentle with them. You know, he doesn't beat them over the head with what the Bible says. And so when we talk to a lost person of the things of God, we've got to remember that we once were lost. When we talk to maybe Christians about the sin in their life, we've got to remember that we sin as well. And that's part of that definition of gentle is being considerate and seeing maybe ourselves and other people's lives and, and where they fail and where we have failed in that way in the past. Now, I'm not talking about compromising the truth 
when you witness to people. I'm just talking about not compromising on the fact that we are to show love and speak the truth in love. Uh, it's, it's one thing to, to tell people they need Jesus and it's another thing to yell at them. I, I look at it, there's a right and a wrong way to tell people they need Jesus, if that makes sense. I hope we understand that. Um, you know, we need to show people that we love them and we care for their soul. And that's being gentle. Now, the same Greek word here in James 3.17 is listed as a requirement for one who is to fill the role of a bishop. We see that in 1 Timothy. And in 1 Timothy, in the King James, it's translated as patient. But it's saying, as a minimum requirement, People in the church, leaders in the church, are to show this attribute, this Greek word apiakes, which is translated as gentle and patient and moderation in another place. But it means being gentle as being considerate and being graciousness. That is a minimum requirement of leaders in the church. But here in James 3, he's talking to all believers. Okay, He's writing to the Jews that have been dispersed that are Christians now, and he's telling them, hey, if you have this wisdom that is from above, if you are a born-again believer, you need to show people that you are gentle. That's a minimum requirement. So in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul's telling Titus this. He says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And so I, and I think gentleness and meekness is related. Meekness, of course, being, uh, being humble and remembering who you are, uh, not thinking too highly of yourself. But Paul is telling Titus, look, these are the things you are to teach. These are the things that you are to hammer home with these people in the church is that, for one, they are to be gentle. And of course, that's contrasted with be no brawlers. You know, don't be, don't be ready for a confrontation all the time. You know, don't be ready to try to beat somebody down and show them how you're right and they're wrong. But they are to be gentle. And so, he was commanding Titus to even preach this with all authority. That's what he was telling him to teach. He said, you have the authority to teach to be gentle. And that's a command that you have. And then in Philippians 4, 5, it says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And the word moderation there is the same word that we're talking about in James 3, 17, a pia case. Um, that's not us going out and proclaiming to the world how gentle, how considerate, how moderate we are. He says, let your moderation be known unto all men. Because if you do it the right way, you're not going to have to proclaim it yourself. You're not going to have to say to somebody, look how gentle I am. Look how considerate I am. Because your actions will speak for you. Um, and people will speak for you. You can look back in the Gospels and there's a time when Jesus is questioned by the Pharisees. They say, well, look, you give witness to yourself. You know, you're proclaiming that you're this Messiah. But he said, no. He said, my Father gives witness to me. And these people that I've healed give witness to me. And so if you are gentle, if you're living with the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, if you're living with the wisdom of God manifest in your life, other people will see it. You won't have to tell people how godly you are or how you're living a life after Jesus Christ, but other people will do it for you. God will do it for you. We're not going to have to try to make a case to make people believe us when we say we're Christians. But that verse also, where it says, let your moderation be known unto all men, that means you need to show it to all people. God is no respecter of persons. We'll see that more later on in James 3.17. But we also saw it in James chapter 2. You know, that God is not a respecter of persons. We are not to show partiality. We're not to be gentle to one person and rough with another one. Because we are to show it to all men. Granted, 
there's different issues and things that we have to confront people differently, but we can be gentle in every way that we can. We're not to make exceptions to who we show gentleness to, who we are considerate of, who we show mercy to. And then another thing it says in that verse is the Lord is at hand. Now, there's a lot of talk in this day and time, by how we're living in the last days. The Lord is coming back. Okay? Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians saying, the Lord is at hand 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago. Well, just under 2,000 years ago. I'll get it right here in a minute. But he wrote that 2,000 years ago, roughly, give or take a few years. And the thing is, the Lord was at hand then, and He still is now. Whether you believe that he's coming back tomorrow or it's going to be another 2,000 years, what we are commanded to do is to be ready and to be watchful. And that is part of being ready is letting people know who Jesus Christ is, letting people know what they can have in his salvation, what, letting people know what being indwelled by the Holy Spirit means, letting people know how they can have that peace that passes all understanding, that only comes from Jesus Christ. And so, if we believe Jesus is coming back someday, then we also need to believe that we need to be ready. That we need to be ready for, the, for Him to come back. But if the Bible says being gentle and considerate is being part of godly wisdom, I think we ought to want that. We ought to desire that. We look back in the Psalms and David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And that's when David had he'd fallen into sin or he purposely committed sin. We say fallen into sin like it's an accident. But he purposely sinned, slept with a married woman, had her husband killed, but he knew it was wrong. And he said, create in me a clean heart, O God. And we need to ask that regularly. Because we sin, we fail, we neglect to maybe show gentleness to people, and we need to repent of that. And ask God to give us that new regenerate heart. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. And so Paul was addressing the Corinthians in the gentleness and meekness that Jesus Christ was known for, that Jesus Christ exemplified. Now, if gentleness is part of the wisdom of God, it only makes sense and it is only right that when God walked this earth, He showed that gentleness. He showed that attribute. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Aristotle. He's considered the father of Western philosophy. He lived 400 years before James wrote this epistle. But here's what he said about this word that we have translated for gentle, a pia case. The word... It, he said, it is an indulgent consideration of human infirmities. So that was his definition of the word 400 years before James wrote this epistle. And so we can look at, in a roundabout way, that that's maybe part of the meaning that, that James is putting here, that it's an indulgent consideration of human infirmities. And so we look at, as Christians... When the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, or lift others up before yourself. You know, that's what James is saying here when he uses this word. But in talking about Jesus Christ and how he showed this gentleness and this meekness towards us, Hebrews 4.15 It says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And so the ultimate example of being gentleness, as, as it's defined by the Bible, as it's, as it's defined anywhere else, is Jesus Christ. Because He had that regard, that consideration for our human infirmities. In that one, knowing that we will sin... We see that God instituted this plan from the beginning of the world, knowing that we would sin, was ready to send His Son to die for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what Romans 5, 8 says, that God commended His, His love towards us in that way. And so, you can bet that He considered our human infirmities the way that we could not completely follow the law when He went to the cross. 
He knew we would sin. He knew we would turn our back on Him. Yet, He still, He took the beating, the scourging, the, the mockery, the spitting, and the cross, knowing that there'd be some that would flat out reject the gospel. And that's the spirit behind what this word gentle means. Putting others before yourself. Considering the fact, yes, they may have failed, but you've been there. You failed as well. And that Jesus gave his life even though we didn't deserve it. You know, there may be somebody that doesn't deserve your compassion or your being considerate of them. But neither did you when Jesus died for you. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 86. And we'll look at a few verses here and we'll be done. As you're turning there, you may or may not be familiar with the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And this is what the writers of the New Testament had. So when they read the Old Testament, they read the Greek Septuagint. And so it helps sometimes to see how these Greek words in the New Testament were used in the Old Testament in the Septuagint. So Psalm 86.5 uses this same Greek word in the Septuagint. And what it says here in our King James, or you may have a different translation in my King James, it says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. And so that phrase, ready to forgive, that's that same word. And so David, is, as he's saying this prayer, writing this psalm, he tells the Lord, hey, you're gentle. You're ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all that call upon thee. So knowing that I'm going to mess up. See, even before David sinned with Bathsheba and had Uriah killed, God was going to be ready to forgive him when he repented. And when you sin, whatever sin it may be, God is ready to forgive because he considers us. And so turn with me to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8, verse 4. This should be, I hope it's a familiar verse. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? And so. David is writing this. He says, what are we that you even consider us? That you even think about us? We're nothing but dust. And there will come a time unto dust we shall return. But yet you think about us. You give us the blessings that we have that we don't deserve. You give us your son to die on the cross again that we don't deserve to make a sacrifice for our sins. He doesn't have to, but he considers us. And it's beyond human understanding as to why. If David, a man after God's own heart, couldn't understand why God even thinks about me. And maybe that helps us to understand how awesome God is and how merciful and gracious God is. Because we don't deserve anything that He's given us. And turn with me to Psalm 18, verse 35. David is writing here as well. He says, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Now this psalm is also recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 22. And that's at the end of David's life. Okay, and so David, he's writing this psalm, and he's looking back on all his past battles. And he's remembering how God's gentleness gave him victory in those battles, that he considered David, that he was gracious with David, and that he won those battles, that he proclaimed him king of God's nation, Israel. And then he's also looking back on all the sins in his life. I've mentioned his sin with Bathsheba and having Uriah murdered. He's looking back at how even after his sin that God forgave him when he repented and he created in him a new heart He's looking back how he didn't deserve it, but yet God's gentleness, he gave it to him. 
God, in His gentleness, considered David with grace. And He's considered us with grace. And then we are to consider others with grace. We are to show that gentleness with consideration and grace and mercy as God has shown us. And so as I said earlier, that gentleness is taking someone in authority and making them a servant. And that's the example that Jesus gave that we see in John 13 when he's washing the disciples' feet. This is the creator of the universe sitting down and washing a couple of fishermen, a tax collector, someone that was going to betray him, washing their feet. And so he's considering them. The God who thought it not robbery to be with God but came to dwell as us. He emptied himself. Not that we did anything to deserve any of it. But yet he considered us. He was gentle in that he had this compassion, consideration, with implications of tolerance and graciousness. That's the wisdom from above that's gentle. We see it in Jesus Christ. We, we ought to see it in each other. There was a Puritan preacher named John Flavel. He wrote that it is impossible that we can be cruel to others except we forget how, Christ, how kind Christ has been to us. It is impossible we can be cruel to others except we forget how kind Christ has been to us. And so when we're dealing with people, whether they're lost, whether they're in the church, whether they're backslidden, we have to remember... It's imperative that we remember what Christ has done for us because we need to show that mercy. We need to show that grace. There's that saying, you catch more bees with honey than with vinegar. I guess it depends on what you're eating. If I'm eating turnip greens, I like vinegar on them. But, you know, the point is clear. We are to be gentle. We are to speak the truth in love. We can do a lot of harm for the kingdom of God by being jerks. And sometimes that's easy to do. And so when you're talking to people, when you're witnessing to people, we need to understand, we need to remember that we, maybe we need to pray. Lord, give me the right attitude here. Because sometimes we let our flesh enter into these conversations and we do more harm than we do good. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this.